In order to be a commercial fisherman, you must have a strong back and a weak mind. If your back is very weak, you, there's no need of trying to be because you cannot be a commercial fisherman. And if your mind begins to get the least bit of strength, you won't want to do it. I was born on the waterfront, down right by the river. That's how I got to know Henry that well, you know. And uh, when we were little kids, we used to go over and hang around, around the shack, enjoy the awesome. Had a lot of buddies down there, a lot of friends, a lot of friends. My family was well known, and my father knew every, everybody. And uh, knew Henry, Henry, of course, Henry. Everybody knew Henry, because he was the best man around. And uh, best fisherman, best net, best build boats. He did know his stuff, you know. And uh, he knew the water like a map. Every inch, every inch of that river, he knew everything about it. I've seen his shipping bills, and he shipped everything from weak fish and bluefish to shad and sturgeon, catfish and eels, and something called mullet. He kept meticulous records of what he paid the hands and what a pound of butter cost, how much money he spent for gasoline for the boats, and I don't think he ever used a boat that he didn't build himself. By his account, he'd built more than 100 boats. Some of, them, some of them only 18 feet long, some of them 20 feet, and one, the last boat he built, one of the last ones, the, the cruiser Lydia G, named after his wife. When he decided to make fike nets <clears throat> to catch smelt, among other things, he didn't go to the store or call the tackle supply shop. He went out in the woods, and cut hardwood saplings. He built his own steaming box. He steamed the saplings until they were pliable, and then he bent them into perfect circular hoops. And 60 years after the fact, they're just as good as they were then. He built hundreds of eel pots, and every one of those is a work of wonder. Every single one is perfect, and every single one, because he took such good care of them and such care in building them, Every single one of them is as good today as it was when he used them to catch eels out there in the Tappan Sea. He fished through the ice in the wintertime. Out on the ice he would go with his partner. They had an ice saw with huge teeth on it that they used to cut holes, trenches in the ice. And then with long poles, again from the woods, they would guide 10 foot by 10 foot nets under the ice and let them hang there like bed sheets on a, on a drying line. And then they would come back the next morning and chop the ice out again and lift those nets. And they were looking for striped bass, but they caught sturgeon and they caught catfish and I suppose just about everything else that was swimming around under the winter ice. But what he really lived for was shad fishing. And he was a shad fisherman par excellence. And in the days when from the Bear Mountain Bridge to the Battery in Manhattan, there was a row of nets every 1,500 feet. He was still the iconic fisherman. He was still the big dog. I was born over on Croton Point. In, uh, January the 7th, 1903. So that makes me a pretty old goat, huh? When my mother, I, evidently she saw a drowning or something from a youngster. So when we moved from Croton Point over to Crotonville, the property ran to the river's edge, the Croton River's edge. However, my mother was so afraid of the water, she said, now you can't go to the river until you learn how to swim. Well, I don't know where I'm going to learn how to swim, but I finally, I, I made it. I sneak away and learn. So my, in order to keep me in the yard, to keep me from going to the river, my mother took all my clothes off, but my underclothes, and she put, she made a long red dress. And the red dress just about cleared the ground. Well, she figured that would keep me in the yard. 
Well, they did for a little while. Then after a while, I, you know, I was ashamed to go out. So after a while, I cast the shame aside and I ran with the rest of them. And I'd go to the river and I'd climb the trees and we used to play tree tag. So after a while, a little piece of that dress was on, on the different trees around the neighborhood. And it got so ragged, my mother got ashamed and she gave me back my clothes and that was the end of the dress. <laughs> when I first started, I started fishing out of Croton River, fishing outside here, but I used to have to come down the Croton River and uh, set the nets out here in the, in the, in the Hudson. Well, I fished for shad. That was uh, when I first came down here, I fished for shad. My started off as a commercial fishing with a man that owned the beach scene, the hall scene. And uh, that was in uh, 1920, just after I left school. I didn't get way to understand. I quit school, see, because uh, I don't know that teacher got to the place where they was asking me questions all the time and I figured what the hell I came here to learn something I didn't come here to answer <laughs> so anyhow I went fishing and uh, that was in 1920 when I made it I made a business of it previous to that time I used to fish at night with a little bit of a saying that I used to catch these German carp and I was going to high school then I convinced an old guy to buy a, a net, a, a little seine, and which he did. But I, at that time, I knew how to repair and I knew how to build them and everything. But I'd go to school and I'd been out a good part of the night and naturally and get in the study hall and fall asleep. And the teacher would wake me up and I used to think that was the most uh, I don't see how she could be that, that cruel. Oh, that used to take me off. So that's why I become the, I came to be the know nothing that you hear talk now, but I, I, didn't, I didn't spend too much time there. About two and a half years I went to high school. Then in 1926, I came down to this place here, and that's when we had the old Shadamak Boat Club house and uh, which was our headquarters. Up in the Croton River, there wasn't nothing much. It was just rowboats. And uh, you, don't, you, never, you never saw a power boat until I was quite a, a big lad. And there was an old fellow, he, he bought a old one lung boat. And he used to be, that had to be low because he had to get under the, under the drawbridge, the trestle bridge. It was all, all sails, sails in the early part, and they carried uh, produce up the river and down the river, you know, from the farms and such places. <clears throat> but uh, all the boats were small. Every kid that you ever saw up the, up the river that time, he could roll the boat. You see some of these lugs around here now, they, they go out there and they, they growing people, they don't know how to row, you know, the oars is up in the air, you know, they think it's a seagull coming along. But uh, when I got down here, uh, that was when I had the first power boat. And uh, that was an old wooden boat. I, th I think it was about 20 feet long, I forgot now. And it was powered with a one cylinder engine, a Palmer, if I remember right, uh, made in Costco, Connecticut. The, and uh, this was a big coal yard dock then. And I had a partner then, and he was an old time shad fisherman. So that's how I got acquainted with this, this deep water fishing. Whereas, of course, in those days during Prohibition, the boats, some of the rum boats used to come up the river. And if there was had to where the, the load was supposed to be dumped off here at night, they were on one of the docks in the coal yards and places. Well, sometimes we'd be going out on uh, Friday night when we weren't supposed to be fishing, but it was under cover of darkness when you set the net, and then when you lifted the net, we uh, were still covered with the darkness. 
So we'd go out, and there was the boat laying off there waiting for the tide till they come into the dock, and the, the rum boat, you know who they were. No lights, and of course we wasn't running with no lights either. <laughs> so we'd, the, we'd pass in the night, they didn't say nothing to us, we said nothing to them. So we bought some secondhand poles from an old, old fisherman that used to be here. And then, I think in 1933, 1934, he wanted to get out, so I bought his half of the business, and I became the sole owner. In the first season that I came down here fishing, we was bad. We had a bad, bad season. We only had a small crew, my partner and I. And when I came to the river. I had a, a Cadillac touring car, and things were so bad that when we left, when we quit for the season, we owed a $40 grocery bill, and no money, and I had sold the car and put the car and the, bus and, and the money in the business, and it was so bad that whatever was left after he paid the, the, the workers, He'd take the money one week, and I'd take the profit another week. And I, as I said, put the money in the business and walked home, and I, I don't know what the hell I had. I had a very few dollars, but I saw in the jewelry store I had some cut beads that, that I knew my wife liked. And I think they cost as much money as I had in my pocket, maybe $25. So I bought them, and that was, that was the result of that season. Broke. But we went on, there was other seasons when, you know, you made money. I remember one time I made a pull up there in the cove, and I had, as I say, I had 2,000 feet of rope on each side, and then they made this big circle, and then when you pulled it in, we had reels on the beach to do it. That brought the line in. Well, one time, we went up there, putting that in at 10.30 in the morning. So when it wound up, as I say, it was 13,000 pounds. It was 10,000 pounds of shad, 2,000 pounds of striped bass, and 1,000 pounds of what we would call trash, that is catfish and uh, big uh, carp and such stuff as that, but we didn't count that. So we used to go down to the market, and uh, there was always uh, men there, lots of them that had fished all over the world. They, they were real regular fishermen, that's all they knew. So they used to kind of welcome coming up here in the river when they knew that I was coming up into the river. And they'd come here and they'd say, oh, what a beautiful place, nice and smooth, no, no weather. But before the season was over, after working, they were working out of big, big schooners, we were working out of 20-foot boats then they realized that uh, this river could get kind of angry. <laughs> I went out of here one night to go out to lift a row and there were loads of fish. So I take two boats and when we would set the net, you know, we take the net off every time. When we go to set the net, I knew that there was the net was in three pieces, what we call, where we had uh, shots, we call them. They were 400 foot shots, and they were attached to each other. Uh, so it's, you know, to make the, the, the complete row. Well, where the, the second shot ended, he said, take, take one of the, ro the big rowboats, tie it there when we set in the net, so that when we come up to this place, we'd be pretty well loaded with fish, we transfer boats. We tie that one, the loaded boat, to the pole and get in the other one and continue lifting. And that, that one shot of net to the west would have as much fish as the first two had, see, because they were in deeper water. Well, one night, we went out of here and it, that, the, the condition was like I speak of, and it was dead calm. It was in the middle of the night. I don't know where the wind came from. That wind came up before we got all the way across. I had gone out and, and uh, finished the boat, the, the one boat, loaded it, and went into the second boat. 
But then the wind came up. It blew a gale. So we had a hard time working. My motorboat was tied on the west pole. That's where we was gonna end up. You know, I roped that net in, fish and all, and when I got to the place where I wanted to go up against the power boat to get in to tie this the small boat to it, I couldn't make it because the waves were so big that I didn't know if I, the two boats met, you know, they would mash up. So we had a pretty busy day, but uh, uh, no harm, nobody got hurt on it, just lost a night's fishing and, uh, and the net. In the winter, there was no navigation, the river froze, and the only boat that you saw was uh, uh, ice boats, you know, that ran on the water. And that, they remained closed until the ice broke up in the spring. And, uh, there, as, for, as for ships, there was no ships. There was one ship after I came down here. This is in, uh, in 26. There was one boat that used to go up, and that same boat would come back. It used to go up to as far as Poughkeepsie, uh, to the Dutton Lumber Company. And uh, that was a lumber boat. And I don't know where it come from, but it was a, a big ship. And that was the only ship that we'd see. The rest of the navigation was all tugs and barges. And they only ran until the river froze up, and they were through until the spring. There was no navigation at all. And then, later on, Albany was made a seaport. Then we had ships flying every flag that you can imagine coming up back and forth up here. I remember one boat in particular was uh, Chiquita, the banana boat. She carried bananas. It was a white, big white ship. And uh, I don't know whatever happened. Uh, they land somewhere else, so they don't go to Albany no more. We had a boat that was loaded with booze. It was a, a sailing yacht. They wanted to go into Scarborough Dock to unload. But the boat was so, it was a big sail of the boat and actually a deep keel. They got stranded on the bank of the channel, ran, ran aground there. So they took the little boat, they loaded that with some stuff and they were supposed to have the trucks on Scarborough Dock to receive this load. Well, they brought the little boat in and the cops were back there waiting. Of course, they didn't see them. So one of the laborers that they had, he was supposed to be helping them. And when he saw what was going on when those cops appeared, he started to perspire. So he reached in his back pocket to get a handkerchief out and the cop shot him dead, state cop. Well, anyhow, that ended that, but the, the trouble with it is the boat was still stuck there. So what they did, they tried to unload the booze that was in, uh, sewed up in burlap bags. That on each side of the boat, they run the, they dump the stuff. And they still couldn't get off. So they had to have it, uh, there was a Coast Guard that stood by there too. And they wouldn't allow nobody to stop. So I said to myself, this don't seem right. So I took, Leads maybe, maybe they would come to less than a pound altogether. And I tied them to, to a light fish line. And I wound the line around a piece of cork. And as you, they couldn't stop you from going past. And when I get to the right location, I have my hand over the side, open my hand up, and there was the marker. There was this little float, the cork was floating. Nobody paid attention to it because there was always debris around. So I went down with the fellow my, the fellow that used to be at this club. So we was gonna pick up some of this stuff. So I was riding in the little dink and I had an outfit that I had made for dredging for uh, drowned bodies. That, uh, it was a bar, it was about six feet long. I had a bridle so that it ran up to a single line and about every six inches I had a, 
a treble hook, you know, a, hook, a three prong hook with a little short line on to it. So the first time this, this fellow was running the boat and the first time he ran over the ground, I felt we hooked into uh, some of the bags, see? And then I held my hand to stop and before he could stop, I felt this load that I had go over top of one heap and start up the other side where they had dumped the, the other booze. So I, I pulled it up. There was five bags of booze on it. So I unhooked one bag, handed it to him. He was shaking like that, you know. He dropped it overboard. So I unhooked another one and gave it to him. Same thing. Well, I said, this is no good. <laughs> I put the thing, put the rail, the, the, the pipe over top of the, with the hooks on, over top of the gunnel, and I brought, brought the whole thing in. This guy, he was so nervous, he says, well, let's go. Well, I said, geez, we, you, you might just as well stay here and get a load because if you get caught, uh, one bag is just as, just as bad as a boatload. I said, you, you're, you're wrong. Oh, no, no. So I don't know, we made it another couple of trips and we uh, come in. I lived on Croton Avenue next to the police station. So he said, we better not bring it to your place. He says, we'll leave it to my place. He lived down a little ways from me on, the, on Broadway. So I said, okay. So we unloaded the stuff in his place. Well, that was all right. And then I met him a while afterwards and he said to me, he said, you know, my wife got so afraid. He said, she gave the whole outfit to somebody for $25. Well, you know, that it should have been 2,500 for it, that goes. So he says, I'm going to give you the line share, he says. That would be $13, and he was, going to, he was only going to take 12 uh, I said, no, I'll keep it all. I said, your boat. So I left it go with that. Afterwards, oh, a little while afterwards, a friend of mine up in Crotonville, he lived with his sister. So I went with him. Instead of bringing the booze in, I of course had a big shanty, I would have had it here. But it become so uh, public that uh, I said, well, take it up to his house. Took it up to his house and we put it in his sister's cellar. So Joe was a guy that liked to tip his elbow too, you know. So it looked like he had all his friends around and they were sampling this booze, you know. We had all kinds of stuff. So I, my, his sister called up, she says, I wish you'd come up, she says, and take that stuff out of the cellar. She says, Joe is drunk. And when I went up on top of the hill where they were, Joe was laid out, had empty bottles in his, in his arms, and he was dead to the world. So I went up, I had an old shovel leg car, touring took the cushion out and I had a big blanket and I'd load up this stuff in and come down and park it in the police station yard. And you know it stayed there and had no trouble at all. I went down, got some cigars and sat over on the bank steps <laughs> and kept my eye on it. Nobody bothered it. So when it come night, I had a place to deliver it. I was down the Sleepy Hollow Country Club. So I guess everybody knew what I was doing because every corner I'd come to, there was a cop there and I knew what he wanted, so I used to pull out a couple of bottles. <laughs> but in the end, I don't know, I was kind of sorry I bothered with it because I don't know, I, 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 I guess maybe I got a couple thousand dollars, but I'm not a drinker or not a gambler. But you know, when I come to sum it up for my share, I don't know where that money went. It just seems like it slips away fingers.
There's a picture down at the club there of a sturgeon. Well, I never never fished for them so much down here, but it used to catch the smaller ones in the net. But we fished, I fished up at Dwarf Lakes with the Crawford. And in fact, there's a picture of a boat that I built 50 years ago. It's down in that clubhouse. I, I have weighed, often weighed out of that boat over 5,000 pounds of fish. And it shows him with a sturgeon laying across the boat. Now, there's only one explanation for that fish being across the boat. You'll probably never see it again. That fish happened to be dead. Otherwise, he'd knock that boat apart like it was a chip. See, that's, that it wasn't a great big sturgeon. I'd maybe weigh 250, 275 pounds. But uh, that was the only reason for him coming in that way. Because if they were alive, you, wouldn't, you couldn't get them in the boat. But they do, they used to lash them up alongside of the boat and, and, and tow them in. I've, I've seen a 500 pounds, but uh, I, I didn't catch them. They're strong fish, you know. Yeah. Now, they put uh, the law on them now. You can't take no kind. We had two kinds that came here. The big sea sturgeon, which were uh, uh, originated in this river, and they were, uh, when they grew to a certain size, then they went back to sea. And they never come back to the river until they were adult fish and ready to spawn. That's both male and female. And then the other kind, that's that is the sea, the sharp, we call them sharp nose or sea, sea sturgeon. They had very rough skin and the skin was like sandpaper. And then there was like these little barnacles like it was on the top, on the sides. And they all had to be cut off before you skinned them. But uh, these, these uh, the smaller, the round nose sturgeon, I don't think I ever saw one over 15 pounds. They, they don't get very big. And sometimes we used to, uh, when I used to use them, get enough around those and I remove the the, the roll from it, which is the caviar. And uh, it's a good four dollars and a half a pound for it there. Now today I guess it costs more than fifty dollars a pound. But then they can't take them no more here. Well I'll tell you one thing. It's got me, I don't know what I'd be able to do it, but I'd like to think that I was. It put me out of business. That is they put uh, they re you couldn't take the striped bass with a, say, with a net anymore. It allowed you only one fish with the hook and line. And uh, that was my main source of supply, that is of, of getting the fish for the market. Now, they also, there's, there's a lessening of the shad. The shad, they, it, we think they would have restrictions on keeping the nets off of the spawning grounds up there. That's, you know, way up the river, uh, uh, terribly in the places where they spawn. There's less and less shad going up all the time. And what shad that does come up the river today, they are hindered, the fishermen are greatly uh, hindered from catching them due to the fact that there's so many striped bass now that the striped bass get in the nets, they really tear the nets, and they shake the shad out. So they got so many, they have so many striped bass that sometimes the people have to, the fishermen remove the nets altogether because they can't, they got help, they're paying the help, and the help go out there, they waste all their time picking out these striped bass and throw them overboard. So that, uh, that really ruined the fish. And then I guess they they knew I was beginning to age a little bit, and maybe that's what they put the restrictions on, so I couldn't fish. I want to tell you something about that. I never had no trouble. Of course, there wasn't a whole lot of us that fished off in the deep water. Never had no trouble at all. For simple reason, I built up an outfit so that I had three 
rigs, three outfits, three different crews I fish. And I would like to think that being I was large enough and as, I don't know whether it's stupid enough or tough enough that nobody tread on my toes. There was one gentleman, I call him a gentleman, he's dead and gone now, that's the only reason I'm doing it. He come down in front of my row that I was fishing and he started to what they put a marker in. Maybe he was a thousand feet below me, maybe not so far. I knew that he was gonna run a row out there but he was, I don't know, he was half a fisherman. He, he, was, he wasn't not much of a fisherman. So I had to cook, my cook, I wrote a note, I sold to him. I said, if you place another pole, which is the beginning of your row, on that row, I said, I will have a row of poles in front of you and I'll chase you from here to the battery in New York. Well, he didn't, he never went no farther with it. So we had a meeting one time down the engineer's uh, office in New York, and uh, they wanted to make the restrictions that if you could put the rows 1,500 feet apart legally. So everybody had their say on to it. And of course, I was mostly the, the, the deep water fisherman up here. So I objected. So what is your objection? Well, I says, the objection is down the river. The river is narrow. The schools are unbroken. And the people that fish these nets 1,500 feet apart have a very good chance of catching fish. You're behind me and this gentleman, he's behind you. Uh, the schools are, you know, they're thicker then. But I said, when we get up here, we had a wider part of the river, and the, the fish had more room to swim, and the schools had been broken up. So that's my objection. Well, he says, uh, supposing, he said, oh, how would you control this spot? Oh, I said, uh, well, how would you control that place to keep people from getting in front of you? Oh, I said, uh, we had uh, a gentleman's agreement, I said. So he said, uh, like this, for instance, Abby didn't pull that letter out that I had sent to the son of father, and he, he read that off. He says, well, I said something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, as far as for being bothered, I never was bothered. Never was bothered at all. I don't know what went on in people's heads, but uh, that was the way it was. And I was big enough to you know, take care of myself, and I always had plenty of poles around, and I had uh, the crews that I could double them up or rob a crew, one, one man from each crew or two men, and, and go continue to fish and still take care of the people that came in front of me. <laughs> well, what, what we did in the old days, uh, this is something that always seems amusing to me, the engineers, the, the army engineers had, you might say, the control of the river. So they were the ones that would told this man that Eno was too far out in the channel. They used to tell me, I used to try to stay back a little bit, but then as the season wore on, it looks like the shad were inclined to be farther offshore into the deeper water. So, uh, I uh, probably, perhaps I shouldn't tell you this because, but it's too late now. I don't think they could do a hell of a lot to me. I used to wait till nighttime, and I'd have my row had already been established, but I wanted to get out into a little bit better water. So I'd wait till nighttime, and I have it set up. I run maybe four or five spaces out in the channel, and those spaces would catch more fish than all the rest of it. But uh, do it in the nighttime, of course, I probably, you would deem that as being dishonest, but uh, then again, the fish, <laughs> they're known to be crawling. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if I've answered your question. You know, I'm I'm a far, I'm a great talker. You know, I, at home I'm not allowed to talk, and of course then when I get out, you know, I, I exercise my privilege of uh, you know being able to talk. So 